What is up guys, NFJJ back at it with another video. So this is definitely not a normal video for my channel. Although it is NASCAR, diving into the NASCAR iceberg is not something I planned on doing. However, many people on Twitter wanted to see a video on it, and no one else had planned on doing it, so naturally I'm going to take one for the team. A little bit of housekeeping needs to happen before I get into it, so you can go ahead and skip to the actual video if you don't care about all the little details. First of all, the first part is going to be pretty surface level. I debated not doing it at all, but if non-NASCAR fans, or if some people who aren't diehard fans, see the series, then I want to make sure they have a basic understanding of the sport. This is not my iceberg. According to this tweet, which is where I initially saw the iceberg, a Reddit user by the name of Quapple Nation made it. So all credit to him or her for making this possible. Some things are very vague, and I will do my best to explain each event or concept to the best of my ability. Also, if you think I missed out on the context of something or missed some little details here and there, be sure to let me know in the comments below. I want this to be a community project, not my own, so like I said, missed anything at all, be sure to comment down below. That's all for the housekeeping, so if you do enjoy the video, leave a like and subscribe, and stay tuned for the upcoming parts. It only gets crazier and better from here. Tier 1 is pretty basic foundational information that almost all NASCAR fans should have heard of. Even casual fans or non-NASCAR fans will be able to identify some or most of these things. This is just referring to the fact that no single person holds the most championships in the Cup Series, but three drivers hold that. This is the stereotype that says, all NASCAR does is turn left. Turning left also helps save drivers' lives, especially back in the day when safety was not what it is now, so drivers would not hit driver's side first into the wall. Although everyone knows that NASCAR races on ovals, NASCAR does race at circuits called road courses. It's now common to race 6 or 7 every season, but even as recently as 2017, there were only two road courses on the schedule. NASCAR has three major national divisions the Cup Series, which is the top level, the Xfinity Series, and the Truck Series. Naturally, drivers progress from Trucks to Xfinity to finally the Cup Series. Compared to other sports, they are the minor leagues. However, the competition is still so competitive, and many fans tune in every week to see these drivers race. Many drivers make a career in the quote, lower series. This cheer originated from the time of Dale Earnhardt Sr. and was meant for him. When Dell Jr. took up the steering wheel, he also inherited the chant. It's a catchphrase that many NASCAR fans also use to celebrate the legend of Dale Earnhardt Sr. In other contexts, it is used commonly when people do anything stupid that is under the redneck umbrella. If you've been to a race, you know the craziest beer drinkers are these guys. Although race fans are not just the rednecks, it's a common stereotype of NASCAR. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is the son of Dale Earnhardt Sr., obviously. There are some good junior events later down in the iceberg. This is Dale Jr.'s podcast where he brings on a new racing guest every single week. There have been some controversial figures on here that have led to information to some events even into the depths of the iceberg. NASCAR's most popular race, the season opener in Daytona, Florida. This is the race that Dale Sr. tragically passed away after an accident in the last corner of the last lap of the race. This race is known as the perfect storm. The entire East Coast was snowed in because of a massive snowstorm, which happened to be the day CBS broadcasted the first live start-to-finish Daytona 500. Cal Yarbrough and Donnie Allison crashed on the final lap, leading to Richard Petty winning. A fight broke out between Yarbrough and Allison, which led to an influx of fans and interest. Pixar Cars is the first movie on the list, with a couple more here in a second. However, there are a lot of references to NASCAR in the movie, events based on real NASCAR events, fictional cars based on real NASCAR drivers, and even drivers that voice act throughout the movies. Days of Thunder is an amazing movie that follows a fictional driver Cold Trickle that shows the real hardships of being a new driver in NASCAR. Talladega Nights is a comedic movie poking fun at NASCAR. Although some people may think it's offensive, most NASCAR fans, including myself, think it's a hilarious movie. Jeff Gordon, nicknamed Wonder Boy and the Rainbow Warrior, is third on the all-times Cup Series wins list with 93 wins. Kyle Busch is the only driver with more NASCAR wins than Richard Petty, with over 220 wins across all three divisions. Bubba is the second African-American driver to win a NASCAR Cup Series race. 
He is controversial because of the... Yeah, so back in 2020 at Talladega Super Speedway, there was a rope tied in the fashion of something that was hanging on the garage door of Bubba's pit garage. A crew member found it and reported it. The drivers stood with him to create a historic moment in the sport. However, the rope had been there and was not planted by someone as initially thought. This led to some people believing Bubba Wallace himself was behind it, sort of like a publicity stunt, but obviously there was no evidence of this. Everyone knows this, but this is the clip that started it. Alright, moving on. The race team that Bubba races for is 2311 Racing. It is co-owned by Denny Hamlin and Michael Jordan. Bubba captured their first and only win at Talladega, the same track the rope was found. Kurt Busch races for the team in the 45 car, with Bubba in the 23, using Jordan's image to the fullest extent. I will say it is very good marketing. The big one is just a massive wreck that takes out a lot of cars. The first incident recognizes the big one was the 1990 Pepsi 400 big one, and the term has gained traction ever since. It can be used to describe wrecks of many, many cars at any type of racetrack, but is conventionally associated with the super speedway tracks, Daytona and Talladega. They crash. A lot. iRacing is a simulator used by NASCAR fans to race against others to get the best virtual experience in the world. NASCAR has official iRacing leagues along with many unofficial fan-made leagues with a large audience. The chase was first introduced in 2004. Before then, a season-long point system would crown the champion. However, the chase was like a playoff system compared to other sports. The top drivers would be reset in points for the last 10 races of the season. Then, whoever had the best 10 race stretch to end the year off would be crowned champion. There have been a lot of variations in the past and is now a 16 driver elimination format playoff system with many other rules and specifications that I don't want to get into. This is a phrase coined by Darrell Waltrip that he used to say in the booth as the drivers took the green flag. NASCAR is actually an acronym. It's not because they're NASCARs, but an acronym that actually means something. This concludes the first tier, which is some pretty surface level stuff, right? Tier 2 starts the tip of the iceberg and goes a little deeper into some things the casual fan does not know. Alright, just kidding, we're not, we're not there yet. Tim Flock was struggling in 1953 after coming off a 1952 championship. His sponsor Ted Chester was a little unhappy and tried to shake things up. To Tim's surprise, he would have a co-driver with him for select races. And this co-driver was none other than Jocko Flacco, a monkey. Yes, a real-life, actual monkey. Although Tim's winless season continued, he believed the monkey gave him an advantage, with the worst finish of 6th in their first 4 races together. Apparently, during the first race that Jocko was on board, in the first corner, one driver saw the monkey and was so caught off guard that he almost wrecked. The duo did find victory lane at Hickory in the 10th race of the season. So Jocko is the only monkey and the last ever to probably win a race in any form or fashion. After 20 years of trying, after 20 years of frustration, Dale Earnhardt finally won the Daytona 500. Dale had won everything except this race and was notorious for losing it in every way imaginable. Dale's greatest rival was the Daytona 500 and was ultimately the race that took his life. NASCAR's officiating is very inconsistent. Judgment calls in NASCAR are made every single race, and sometimes the integrity of the sport is lost in favor of entertainment. At Talladega and Daytona, there was a rule put in place that drivers cannot pass below the double yellow line. What if someone is forced below the line? What if they are avoiding a crash? What if they just get on the line? What if it's on the last lap? So this has resulted in so many judgment calls by NASCAR, which, as we just said, are often controversial. The 1992 Hooters 500 ended a great season-long championship battle in which Alan Kowicki won his first and only NASCAR championship. The term Polish victory lap was coined by Alan. His victory celebration was running a backwards lap, which many drivers, like Ryan Blaney, still do to this day to honor his legacy. If it hadn't been for whiskey, NASCAR wouldn't have been formed. That's a fact. A very inspirational quote by Junior Johnson. 
Junior first realized he had talent behind the wheel because he was a moonshiner back in the 50s, and he was also a pioneer of the sport. But yes, moonshining played a huge factor in why so many drivers started racing in NASCAR. EA used to make video games for NASCAR, and the sport has been struggling in that aspect since EA left. This was once a very popular concept among small teams, in which teams would try and make the race through qualifying, and if they did, they would only run a few laps and park their car to collect a check. These smaller teams had a very low budget, and did not have the equipment to run up front, and there was a huge risk of crashing your car if you're out there running all the laps. It economically made sense to just park the car if you were going to run last place anyway. The Cup Series has gotten rid of it, but there are still start and parks occasionally in the lower series. There are many reasons the charter system was put in place, but what it did do was eliminate these start and parks. The charter system is basically a guarantee to 36 cars that they will make the field, only leaving room for four other entries. A charter is really an intangible thing. It's kind of a contract like saying, hey, no matter what, if you show up, you're going to make the show. Charter owners are rewarded a better race payout than non-charter owners, essentially making it unprofitable for teams without one. Although this leads to a more competitive field, NASCAR lost its small family team grassroots when they created this system. The older and more experienced Cup stars used to enter a lot of races in the lower divisions, specifically the Xfinity series, formerly known as the Bush series. Back in the early 2000s, it wouldn't be uncommon for 10 or more Cup drivers to enter a Bush Series race every weekend. Imagine if LeBron James played in the G League. Yeah. Anyways, Cup drivers are now limited to a few starts per year in lower divisions of NASCAR. The term is also like a double meaning for Kyle Busch because it's got his name in it. He's considered the reason Cup drivers can't compete in lower divisions as he's racked up over 100 wins in the Xfinity Series. Back in 2008, McDowell had this crazy wreck. It proved how safe the then-new COT cars actually were. Son of Kyle Petty and grandson of Richard Petty, Adam is believed to be the first-ever fourth-generation professional athlete in modern U.S. history. Tragically, he passed away after sustaining injuries in a practice crash in Loudoun, New Hampshire. Basically NASCAR's birthplace, NASCAR founder Bill Frent Sr. and numerous drivers, officials, and promoters gathered on December 14, 1947 for a meeting on various issues such as drivers failing to get paid, lack of consistent rules, and other things. After 69 nice days of conversations and ideas, the meeting adjourned on February 21st, 1948 with the formation of NASCAR. Back at Richmond Raceway in 2013, the last race before the playoffs, Clint Boyer spun his car on purpose to help teammate Martin Truex Jr. make it into the playoffs. Martin was just on the edge of getting in. After investigation, NASCAR concluded that Boyer was instructed to spin, and did. Boyer kept his spot in the playoffs, but the Truex team was heavily penalized. This led to sponsors pulling out, the collapse of Michael Walter Bracing, you know, nothing major. A lot of little details are left out, but you can check out some videos made by others describing the entire situation. Giant ugly wing, super dumb, nobody liked it. Rick Hendrick is the most successful owner in NASCAR history. However, one of the aircrafts owned by Hendrick Motorsports was on its way to Bristol Motor Speedway whenever it crashed into a mountain. Ricky, Rick's son, is widely known to die in this event. However, a total of 10 people were killed, including John Hendrick, president of HMS, his twin daughters, and other staff within the team, along with aircraft staff. A very tragic incident. Tim Richmond was a driver who fell ill after the 1986 season, where he won seven races. It came out later that he had acquired AIDS. Due to this, he was unable to compete in the first 11 races of the 1987 season, Buck came back and won the 12th and 13th race of the season, which were his first two races back. Six races later, he was banned for substance abuse. Richmond then sued NASCAR, in which they reinstated him because it was a quote, bad test. Richmond could not find a ride after he was reinstated and never made another start in NASCAR again. Then he died the next year in 1989. Man, what a horrible two years for that guy. 
NASCAR wanted to go to more road courses, but because of contracts with tracks, they were kind of boxed in. So in 2018, NASCAR raced on Charlotte Motor Speedway's road course, coined the Roval, a combination of a road course and an oval. NASCAR has also raced on the Daytona Roval. For the clash in 2022, NASCAR raced inside of a stadium. Kind of wild. This refers to cautions coming out of nowhere for no reason, typically for debris. It is thought by many that NASCAR used to throw these phantom cautions during boring races to bunch up the field, a phenomenon that started in the last couple of decades. I will say they have become less and less frequent over the last few years, maybe because they ran out of excuses, but most notably since stage racing has been implemented. Teresa Earnhardt is known for her horrible relationship with her stepson, Del Jr. Jr. left his family team in 2007, which show how bad the relationship was. There are also some lawsuits, poor management decisions, among with other things, but that's the big thing here. ARCA breaks is the idea that ARCA drivers, a series that is viewed as a step below the truck series in the NASCAR ladder, do not use the brake pedal when trying to avoid wrecks. This is a result of inexperienced drivers being desperate and a lot of times it results in them not hitting the brake pedal and causing massive wrecks for no apparent reason. For the first time in NASCAR's modern history, the 2022 season would feature car numbers that are towards the front of the car. This is slid forward from the traditional center of the car where the numbers used to be. If you're not familiar with the NASCAR community, this was a lot bigger deal than I'm conveying and than what it should have been. It was, and really still is, a massive controversy that's been talked about since the number placement experiment back at the All-Star Race in 2020. Anytime you hear Mickey Mouse in NASCAR, the messenger is just saying that someone did not deserve a certain achievement, something was handed to someone, something is gimmicky or artificial, or someone got lucky. For example, people point to Chase Elliott's championship specifically as a Mickey Mouse championship because he was not the best car over the course of the year, so he didn't deserve the championship, but instead played the gimmicky system to win. Just like the Madden curse, basically drivers on the cover of NASCAR games typically do really bad the next year, or in some cases, the rest of their career. This is referring to the last lap wreck that shocked the entire fan base back in 2020. Ryan Newman had a horrible wreck. I guess the weird thing here is that we did not hear updates on Newman for hours, and track officials brought out like these black curtains reminiscent of times they were extracting bodies out of fatal wrecks, which caused a lot of concern on Twitter, but he only had minor injuries and easily made a full recovery, so that was kind of a weird thing. There are so many great stories about Smokey, who was a very innovative engineer and raced a bit, you should totally take the time to read some of them. He was also a big advocate for safety and actually left the sport when Bill France, the owner, refused to comply with Smokey after he campaigned for safety following his good buddy's death, who was Fireball Roberts. Fireball Roberts was a fan favorite guy and a heck of a driver. He crashed at the World 600 at Charlotte in 1964. He flipped and burst into flames. He was in critical condition with massive burns all over him and secretly had asthma which made the whole breathing in fumes thing a lot worse. A few weeks after the wreck, he contracted an illness, falling into a coma and passing away more than a month after the wreck. Also, Fireball, his nickname, is not some sick joke about his death. That was always his nickname, but it was just unfortunate that it was the way he was taken. Just before the 1986 Winston 500, a fan stole a pace car. He took a couple of laps around the track before officials blocked the track and got him. No jail sentences related to this incident were ever reported. This is just a South Park episode making fun of NASCAR. This is a fan favorite segment that compiles radio messages of drivers and teams from a race into a short 5-8 to eight minute highlight video. Jeff Gordon started at the back of the field in the 1997 Winston, the all-star race, and cut his way up through the field to win. The car was fast, too fast. Crew chief Ray Everingham was called by Bill France to talk about the car. Ray stated, it passed inspection, so it's good. And Bill France said, quote, tomorrow it won't. 
This is known as the race car NASCAR band. Also a pretty cool looking one. NASCAR has a weird history of racing in the rain. We did it for a little bit, but then we stopped. Now we do it again, but it can't rain too hard and it's only at road courses. So yeah, we kind of do it. NR2003 was released back in 2003, but still has a very active community. The ability to easily mod the game has kept the game alive. Modders have made insane fantasy tracks, cars from other forms of motorsports, and every racetrack in the world. In a bizarre scenario, Mark Martin was leading when a caution flag came out. Mark thought he won and went to victory lane before taking the checkered flag, handing the win to second place David Green. This was Green's only win of the season. I'm not exactly sure what this one is talking about specifically, so I'm just broadly going to say that the NASCAR YouTuber community is filled with many different personalities, ideas, and video concepts. Some NASCAR YouTubers are controversial, some are not, but we are going to get into some controversial ones later on. Bob is just one of those guys everyone likes. There are a lot of small things you could add, but essentially Bob is one of the hardest working media members that keeps our community well informed and civil. In the 1987 Winston, Dale Earnhardt made a pass in the grass en route to a win, one of the most popular moves in all of NASCAR history. Except it's not a pass, which kind of adds in another layer of it being iconic altogether. It was an amazing save though. This was a scary crash that could have easily ended horribly, and you could even see my Carmen exposed right before another car hits his. This was just one of those almost freak accidents. Under caution during the 2012 Daytona 500, something broke in Juan Pablo Montoya's car, he lost control and hit a jet dryer, creating a massive fireball. Luckily, no one was injured, but it red flagged the race for hours. It was just unbelievable. This also led to the most overused joke ever, Juan Jet Dryer Montoya, yeah, not, not even that funny. NASCAR made a controversial decision to cover Bristol Motor Speedway in dirt. It remains the only venue that has hosted a dirt race in the last 50 years. This was because of a result of dwindling attendance, and people ask, well, this was everyone's favorite race, you know? But people weren't coming, and they weren't watching it on TV. So this is a little bit deeper than just simply covering the track and it being a useless experiment. It was more of the why, you know? Anyways guys, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was a lot, but I appreciate you staying to the end of the video. Here are the topics covered in the next iceberg part, and if you have information or resources for any one of the more unknown concepts or events, then feel free to share in my Twitter DMs. Link in the description below. I might be tweeting out if I'm unsure about something in particular, so just keep an eye out for that. Make sure you guys are subscribed so you don't miss the next part, because it gets crazy. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.